I'm David Sanger from the New York Times, and uh, welcome to uh, this great session on China's domestic evolution from uh, Mao to Deng Xiaoping the, to the 21st century. Um, it's going to be a terrific panel. Uh, David Lampton is the Dean of the Faculty and Professor of China Studies at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. We'll give you more about each of our uh, panelists, but you can see who they are. Ken Lieberthal, who, of course, is the director uh, of the Thornton Center at the Brookings Institution, has been in and out of governments at various moments, has had to dodge questions from me at, uh, at, at good moments, but uh, answered more than he dodged, which is always my sign of a fabulous government official. Susan Shirk, who's done the same, but is now at the University of California Institute of Conflict and Cooperation. And Ezra Vogel, who um, taught me everything that I know about Japan and China uh, when I was an undergraduate. So if you have any complaints about my coverage from Asia, go check with Ezra. <laughs> and don't miss his book, which um, is terrific. It's the, uh, this incredible um, biography of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, it's long. Bring it with you when you're going on a long vacation. Uh, <laughs> but it's worth it. So uh, there we go. Um, you know, listening to Henry Kissinger uh, uh, out at the, the luncheon, um, it struck me, you, you, we forget two things in most dealings with domestic politics' role as we interchange with countries, which is in most countries, the United States tends to forget about what the domestic politics is in the other state because we assume that everything is just sort of centrally decided. Fortunately, in China, we haven't had that problem because we have all been so aware at various moments of the kind of the pace of change. But the thing that really struck me from Dr. Kissinger's explanation was this description of sending messages and waiting 10 days for the answer. And we're now in a world where a small uprising in a village in China is on the Times' website probably within four hours of the time that it started and where the Chinese, to their horror, are having to worry about the domestic politics in a place like Tehran to try to figure out how they're going to keep oil supplies going in and that, that information moving at the same speed. And in fact, you could argue that in 40 years we have gone from having interchanges that were way too slow to be useful to interchanges that are happening at such an incredible pace that we can make misjudgments just from the fact that they're happening so quickly. And that's how attuned we are now to each other's domestic politics as well. So with that, I will uh, leave this to Dr. Lampton, and I look forward to the talk. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as was stated, I'm David Lampton at Johns Hopkins SICE, and uh, glad to be here. I do want to thank uh, USIP and the Richard Nixon uh, Foundation for uh, sponsoring this. And I do want to uh, mention one person um, who's uh, very central to this institution, but has also been central to the evolution of U.S.-China relations, and that's Richard Solomon, the president of this institution, worked on Dr. Kissinger's staff, played a, a central role in the events uh, we're disco uh, discussing today. Uh, and I just wanted to recall that he's not only a uh, built a wonderful institution here in this gorgeous building uh, under his uh, direction and tutelage, but he's also constructed a very productive uh, relationship, I believe, with China as well. So those are two great legacies uh, for uh, Dick, and uh, I'm sure you all uh, join me in those sentiments. Uh, I also just want to know what was stated earlier, because we're talking about domestic politics and its linkage to U.S.-China relations, is that this has, uh, since the Nixon trip, been a remarkably bipartisan undertaking through eight administrations. And often us Americans, I think, sort of uh, probably most of the time in justified fashion, berate ourselves for our sort of um, uh, responsiveness to the politics du jour. But I think it's an interesting question how we've maintained such a really sort of strategic uh, direction, some tacking back and forth. But basically, uh, for eight administrations, we have a record of a fairly consistent relationship. So I think that uh, is certainly something to take in, into uh, account. Uh, in this segment, we're going to be uh, addressing the linkage between domestic politics, foreign policy in general, but particularly U.S.-China relations. Uh, and I suppose and we're going to try and bracket the period, uh, we'll say, from Mao to now. Uh, 
and we'll start our discussion back at the uh, uh, actually preceding President uh, Nixon's uh, visit to China. Uh, and then, of course, we can uh, sort of move towards the present and talk about how domestic politics as well may be influencing our relationship now. So we'll, we'll uh, span quite a long period of time. Uh, my plan, and it will certainly adjust as we see things evolve, but basically half, I'm going to just ask some questions of my colleagues here on the, uh, the podium. And then uh, my intention is to have about half the time for Q&A, uh, but we'll see how things uh, move. We're very fortunate to have with us today uh, what I will say are three scholars and practitioners that at least in parts of their principally academic careers have had forays and productive forays at that into our uh, own government. Uh, Susan Shirk in the center is LAM Chair of China Studies at the University of California, San Diego and is a director of their system-wide Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation. She was, as uh, David mentioned, Assistant Secretary of State. She had responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia in part of the uh, second Clinton administration. Among her many books and works, uh, uh, the most recent and well-reviewed uh, was certainly China Fragile Superpower. And I'll have a little question about that for Susan as the uh, uh, afternoon goes on. To my immediate left, my, my old friend Ken Lieberthal uh, is director of the John Thornton Center, China Center at Brookings. And Ken was a professor at the University of Michigan from 83 to 2009. He's uh, authored many books, 18 at least, and much else, mostly dealing with China. He served as special assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and senior director for Asia on the National Security Council. Certainly many books are well known, but uh, at least I use in my classes quite frequently governing China. Uh, and to the, my far left, uh, not necessarily politically, but uh, situationally, uh, is Ezra, Ezra Vogel, is Henry Ford uh, II Professor Emeritus at Harvard. He succeeded John King Fairbank as the second director of the East Asian Research Center at Harvard. In the mid-90s, he was National Intelligence Officer for East Asia. He's had numerous stellar books, uh, and uh, I'll just uh, 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 identify three that uh, um, particularly came to mind as I was thinking about this. Uh, Canton under communism in 1969. Japan as number one in 1979, and then, of course, the book that's been mentioned, and I'll uh, ask Ezra about uh, several questions about that, Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China came out uh, with Harvard University Press in 2011. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is just sort of uh, start chronologically when uh, people uh, sort of had their first major encounter with China, and ask Susan, I believe, Susan, you arrived in China shortly after Henry Kissinger and his secret trip, uh, and uh, therefore was the first to, uh, to go to the PRC here on this, this uh, panel. Uh, during the trip, you met with Joe and Lai. Incidentally, I'm doing a book on, uh, that's based on interviews, and I dug up a, a, a transcript of Susan and a group she was with meeting in July of 1971 uh, that included Joe and Lai. Also, interestingly, at that meeting, there were two members of the Gang of Four, at least that the record recounts, uh, uh, Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Chunqiao. Uh, and Zhou, uh, I think, sort of uh, had a very interesting statement, picked out Susan in the, in the group and said, if Susan Shirk was president of the United States, then matters referring to normalization would be easy to solve. Uh, uh, but in any case, beyond that, I wanted to ask Susan, that was a very a unique moment in uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, can you sort of describe for us, Susan, the, the social and political uh, baseline that that moment in Chinese history uh, represented? Uh, and I've always wondered how you interpreted Premier Zhou's behavior in those meetings with a gang of four members present, and what was the sort of political atmosphere both on the wide angle in China and in that room. Well, I'm having a wonderful time this year celebrating the 40th anniversary because there are a number of uh, occasions like this one. And um, not only does this give me 
the opportunity to uh, replay what was probably the high point of my life, Joe and Lai saying that I should be President of the United States, but also uh, on February 20th, 1972, um, my husband and I got married, so we're celebrating our 40th anniversary uh, and also celebrating the anniversary of this historic event. Of course, we spent our uh, honeymoon in uh, Bermuda watching the I was just glued to the television set. I couldn't leave because I was so excited about what was happening. Um, well, back in July of 1971, when our group visited China, we were the second group of Americans to go the, right after ping pong team. And we had this four-hour meeting with Joe and Lai. We were there actually the same time as Henry Kissinger. And uh, so Joe's people said, bring your tape recorders because I have something I want to communicate to the world, but actually it was equally important for him to communicate to the Chinese people uh, why there had been this 180 degree uh, change in China's stance toward the United States. And that transcript was translated into Chinese and became a study document, which also I dined out on that in China for a long time, because uh, a lot of Chinese had uh, heard my name in that context. Um, the interactions between Zhou Enlai and Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Chuanxiao were very, very interesting. Um, I think it's fair to say they, it was just so pa obvious that they were not on the same team. Um, Joe, the, there was a lot of tension in the room. And uh, Zhou Enlai, of course, was very suave, humorous, you know, all the qualities that people have noted um, certainly came through very clearly to us. And Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Chunxiao sat there, these two um, kind of political posers, uh, in a sense, who had become part of Mao's palace clique, the Gang of Four, um, and uh, were known as ultra-leftists. And they sat there not saying very much and looking kind of contemptuous. And Joe, they were clearly there to watch Joe and Lai. And uh, Joe and Lai didn't seem terribly constrained by them. Um, but he also hardly recognized them in the interaction, except uh, once when there was some question by someone in the group that had something to do with, I think, Marxism, Leninist mm -hmm. philosophy or something, then he turned to Yao and Yuan and he said, well, you'll want that question to be answered by the philosophy expert, <laughs> Mr. Yao. And, you know, and so it was, um, it was an interesting interaction. It was pretty obvious that uh, the two of them were watching Joe so that he couldn't get beyond uh, the lines that he had been delegated by Mao in this interaction. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have a lot of other thoughts about the kind of China that we saw in 1971. May I sure. just mention a couple? I mean, I'll just very briefly mention three areas in which China of 1971 that I saw and the China of today are almost like two different countries or two different planets. And so um, before I mention them, I want to say that I think that's why I'm such a skeptical of Chinese cultural explanations, which is, you know, China is China is China, Chinese culture, this great unchanging thing. But what I've seen is Chinese social and political economic behavior changed so dramatically when you change the structure of the system, the structure of incentives that people lived within. So I see Chinese culture as sort of infinitely malleable because of that. Um, the three things I just want to flag, and maybe we can talk about it more, is the, uh, the politicization of social life. Uh, we visited China in 71 during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, 
you know, ideology, the state, the was just penetrated every aspect of people's everyday lives. And uh, ideology was used as a weapon in interpersonal rivalries, jealousies, right from the neighborhoods and schools and factories up to the top. And it was really, it was a totalitarian system and a very oppressive system to live in. And China is a much freer place today, thank goodness. Second, China was a personalistic dictatorship. Uh, Mao ruled with an iron hand. People were afraid of Mao. And it, you know, it was a dictatorship. Nowadays, we have um, a post-dictatorship, collectively ruled Communist Party system with a collective leadership, the Standing Committee of the Politburo that makes decisions by consensus or sometimes doesn't make them at all. And uh, so nowadays, sometimes people yearn for another strong leader, but actually the system has been structured to prevent the rise of another Mao who can go off half-cocked with crazy campaigns like the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution. And then third, of course, is the how backward China was at that time, how poor and backward, drab, uh, with, uh, so nowadays I go to North Korea frequently and I often compare the contrast between Hong Kong where our group had been living, crossing over to China, with now when I go from Beijing to Pyongyang it feels much the same. I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Uh, Ken, I wanted to ask you, you were in uh, China in July 1976. It was a congressional staff delegation. You, you were on it. Um, and among the people you met was Mao's grandniece, uh, Wang Hairong. Uh, this meeting was the morning after the earthquake uh, that hit Tangshan, devastated that city, and uh, had substantial impact in Beijing. It appeared, looking at the transcript and notes of the meeting you were in, that uh, uh, even people in Beijing, 15 miles out of town or at least a short distance, really quite unaware of, of the full magnitude of what had happened and so forth. It's kind of revealing in terms of the kind of communications level uh, in China from that. With that as uh, perspective, what was the physical and political state of China at, not only at that moment but that, that era? Uh, which was not long before Mao Zedong's death. And what were the conflicting kinds of impulses in that society? We hadn't moved along to normalization uh, as far as some might have expected after uh, Nixon's trip. And what were sort of the countercurrents going on in China in, in the period 76 there? And what was that, what impressions did you come away from with that, that moment in 1976? You want, me to give the, you want me to give the entire course on China I used to teach at <laughs> University of Michigan, I think. Uh, first of all, let, let me uh, join with the others in thanking USIP for putting this on. It is for people of the generation up in front of you here a, a trip down memory lane. Uh, much of our careers we, we saw in that auditorium this morning. Mm -hmm. That's really kind of, kind of nice. Uh, Susan has answered in her remarks uh, one of the uh, to date, unanswered historical questions that even Henry Kissinger uh, did not know the answer to is revealed at lunch today, which is why he was kept waiting four hours when he got there. It's because Joe and I was meeting with Susan Shirk. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, uh, there's another aspect of Susan's meeting that I want to mention because it does begin to, it segues into what Mike was raising. Uh, and that is, we knew very little about China in those days. Uh, we, what we especially did not know was what people really thought, right? We knew about the mass campaigns, we knew the propaganda, we knew all this kind of stuff. But we really didn't know how much people took this on board, right? And how much it really motivated people as versus scaring them into uh, acting the way they did. Um, and uh, among Westerners, therefore, we knew so little, even among China specialists, uh, that there, you had the ability to kind of fill in the blanks as you wished. 
And a lot of people filled in the blanks among Western scholars with an ideal, idealistic view of the China they wish existed and argued passionately that that was what was there. What we didn't know must be good news. I always worked, frankly, on the assumption that when the Chinese had good news, they didn't hesitate to tell you. So that uh, probably the reality was much more mixed than that. But I, I recall in Susan and your delegation, uh, I read the transcript not too long after you were there. And I thought to myself, the only one here who asked a serious question was you. And you asked a question about Taiwan that was very intelligent and tough. Uh, the, uh, and the rest were asking about basically, uh, and what are the different ways you can describe nirvana to us? Uh, <laughs> and it was, you know, it was kind of, I think uh, Joe and I was sitting there struggling trying to say something serious given the questions that were asked. You know, so anyway, just kind of recollections. Uh, as, as Mike mentioned, I, I uh, uh, got there the first night I was there, actually 2.40 the following morning, the Tangshan earthquake hit. That earthquake was severe enough that it, frankly, I, I knew it had hit because I found myself on the floor uh, next to my bed uh, in my hotel room. Immediately knew I was in the middle of a catastrophic earthquake. Tried to roll under the bed. You learn all kinds of things in this kind of situation. First thing I learned was you can't roll under a bed in the Peking Hotel in the kind of beds they had there. Then they had kind of boards underneath and you couldn't get under it. Uh, the, uh, we learned about the real magnitude of what occurred because Don Kaiser from the U.S. Embassy had a shortwave radio uh, and he managed to pick up reports on it from the United States and it was basically our earthquake measurement systems that began to feed back information on the magnitude of what had occurred. In Beijing this was a very severe earthquake. Uh, I've lived in Asia quite a bit. I've experienced a lot of earthquakes out there. You know, anyone who's lived in Taiwan and stuff knows you get these kind of rattlers all the time. Uh, this was extraordinary. Uh, in Tangshan, it was utterly catastrophic. And there is no way you would have known that in Beijing. With Wang Hairong, what I remember most is not the meeting, the formal meeting that you read the transcript yeah. of, but rather the, the day before, the afternoon of the quake, uh, we had a meeting at the U.S. Uh, liaison office, uh, a reception there, and she showed up for it, uh, as did you know, all of us. And in the middle of the reception, the earth started going. I mean, one of these aftershocks that was a very significant aftershock. You know, the lamp started to move across the tables and stuff, and everyone fled out into the terrace outside of that, uh, except for Wang Hairong. And she just sat there on the couch the entire time and everyone else came back in. And I thought to myself, well, she's just demonstrated, I'm sure she feels that she was someone of great courage, right? Doesn't rattle easily. Uh, the alternative possibility would that she would have ended up demonstrating that she was the stupidest person in the room if that ceiling had come down, you know? So she kind of lucked out on, on that. <laughs> um, in terms of the politics of that period, remember this is a couple months before Mao died. In fact, I will tell you frankly, when I hit the floor uh, and woke up, I thought to my, my first thought was, oh my God, the Russians have decided to attack and I'm one mile from Chairman Mao. I was actually relieved to realize I was in the middle of an earthquake. I thought my chances of survival had just increased considerably. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, no, things were very, very tense in those days. The night before, a couple of us had gone out walking on the streets of Beijing. I've forgotten the exact time, something like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock that night. Suddenly on every corner there were soldiers uh, with fixed bayonets. Right? So you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, everything may be calm here, but someone is expecting a lot of trouble. Right? Uh, walked down to Tiananmen Square, and there was a big pool of blood. Uh, and, you know, just on some of the stones in Tiananmen Square that was fresh. You know, this was before the earthquake. Uh, so things were really quite unsettled. That was a very, very bad time uh, in Chinese politics. You know, elite politics, and it was felt down through the system. Uh, I had a couple of experiences uh, very early on, on that trip and then on another trip a year later. Uh, where I had a chance to, I mean, just anecdotally, to kind of try to get some sense of what people really thought as versus uh, what they said, you know. And uh, to give you an example, I, w I was out in the countryside in uh, Hebei province and uh, went out for a stroll and, of course, you know, they got very nervous when a Westerner who could speak Chinese went out for a stroll anywhere. 
uh, so they had a guy running after me kind of thing. Uh, but I walked over to, to a peasant, and this, this was not far from Beijing. He spoke Mandarin that I could understand. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, you know, I, I engaged him, and he said, why are you here? Because he had no idea what to say. I mean, I was from Mars, right? And I said, uh, well, I want to learn about China. And as Chairman Mao said, and I use a Mao phrase, you know, without investigation, you have no right to speak. Mao Diao Cha, Mao Fai and Chan, right? He looked at me, he said, oh, he said, you know Mao Zedong thought. And I said, yes. And he turned around and walked away immediately. <laughs> and I am sh sure, uh, I mean, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but I felt very confident. They walked away immediately because the fact that I knew Mao Zedong, you know, knew the politics, uh, knew the catechism, if you will, made me a very dangerous person. Because if he misspoke somehow or other, you know, I represented uh, an unpredictable force. <coughs> I had other occasions uh, in those first few years to have conversations like that, and that was typically what you ran into unless you were talking to, you know, Gao Jigambu, you know, one of these guys up there who played with these kinds of ideas and vocabulary all the time. For average people, this was very scary stuff. You just stayed as far away from it as you could stay. So it was, uh, was kind of interesting. Why don't I stop there? Okay. Uh, Ezra, I want to bring you to right around 1978 and, uh, and join others in saying what a terrific book you've written on uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and I guess my question is, why in 1978 was he so anxious, if that's a description to agree with, to normalize with the U.S.? And how did domestic politics and his own objective shape the way in which the normalization process unfolded? First of all, let me say how pleased I am to be on this panel with uh, so many old friends, both on the panel and in the audience. Um, I think that when Deng came back in 1977, he already was thinking modernization. Mao had died the previous September, and he was clearly in charge of foreign policy, and when I asked Lee Guan Yu uh, about his contacts with Deng, he said that when Deng came, it wasn't that the foreign ministry people gave him uh, advice or teaching. Uh, they followed him. Mm -hmm. He had had more experience and knowledge, and I think at that time, 1977, he came back. He was not yet the top political figure. He was in charge of two areas. One was foreign policy. One was science, technology, education. And I think he thought of both of them in terms of what he had to do for modernization. And he wanted to have, he already had pretty good contacts, uh, pretty good relations with Europe uh, that they could draw on. Uh, he felt that two big countries they needed to make advance on were Japan and the United States. And he therefore set out to uh, develop better relations with those two countries so within days after he came back to work, there were two important uh, things he ha ha meetings he had. One was with uh, education department advisors about what he needed to do to reopen universities and start entrance mm -hmm. examinations that fall. The other was Cy Vance, because Cy Vance was Secretary of State. He wanted to get on with it. Unfortunately, uh, as I alluded to this morning, uh, Carter was not yet ready uh, to... Uh, have negotiations because of the Panama Canal Treaty. Uh, but he realized he needed good relations with the United States. Mind you, Deng had had five years in France from 20 to 25. He had a year in the Soviet Union, 25 to 26, 27. Uh, and he had accompanied uh, Mao on the trip to the Soviet Union in 1957. Mao had tutored him on uh, foreign policy within the communist countries. And from 73, 74, 75, he was, in effect, tutored by Joe and Lyon on foreign relations because he, mm -hmm. he replaced Joe in meeting foreign visitors. So he was intent on forming good relations with the United States in order to pave the way for modernization. I think, as Henry Kissinger said this morning, uh, only Dung could have done all the things he did. He, he had the revolutionary history, 12 years as a commander, uh, something close to a war hero because of his role in the Hawaii Hike campaign. Uh, he had uh, been pragmatic. He had been uh, in charge of the southwest area of 100 million people from 49 to 52. Uh, 
Uh, he had uh, been general secretary for over a decade. Uh, he had extraordinary knowledge and was well prepared. One of the things that uh, impresses me is how good he was at getting along with a lot of different kinds of Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not only did he get along both with Kissinger and Big Brzezinski, uh, but he got along uh, with Ford in December 1975 when he saw him. Uh, he hit it off uh, very well uh, with uh, Carter uh, in the negotiations. Uh, and uh, when he came here in January 79, uh, he hit it off very well, even uh, with uh, uh, Reagan, uh, who started out as part of the Taiwan lobby, but he realized, as, as Kissinger said, that he had to work with uh, China. And the key, I think, to better relations with Reagan was his relation with, with George Bush Sr., which I think maybe deserves even more attention than we give mm -hmm. to it. Because uh, in 1975, when the United States had the liaison office in Beijing, the head of that office was George Bush Sr., and that was the year Deng was really in charge of running things in Beijing, just at the time uh, that George Bush Sr. was there. So they hit it off and melded. So that when the 1989 uh, event hit, uh, George, George Bush Sr. was president, I think the personal relations of George Bush Sr. played a very key role in getting over that. Uh, he also uh, hit it off when he in January 79 with Tip O'Neill uh, mm -hmm. in the Congress. Um, and uh, he later uh, got along uh, with Nixon uh, when, he, when he met Nixon, uh, first at the White House in January 79, and then later when Nixon came to China. So here's a guy who had extraordinary ability uh, to work with a wide variety of Americans. And <clears throat> I think uh, not only did he see uh, the strategic importance of working in the United States for China's modernization, uh, its, its access to science and technology around the world, uh, but that you had, uh, Deng was, I think, brilliant in his managing the transition uh, to a, a more open uh, economy. Um, there are a lot of other Chinese who want to open up, but managing that transition is an extraordinarily difficult project, process. And I think uh, his management of the Communist Party, but also the changing within the Communist Party to manage that transition and the handling of the conservative opposition without leading it to disruptions that really divided the country. I think it really was an extraordinary man, and uh, China was lucky, uh, and I think uh, we were lucky to have Deng. In 1989, after Tiananmen, uh, he said, uh, hey, we should be patient. The foreigners don't have a very long view of history. Uh, before long, the businessmen will be going to their governments and say, we need access to the market. We need to improve relations uh, with uh, China. And he said, you know, despite all those sanctions, uh, we should not close our doors. We should open our doors wider. Mm -hmm. And I think that determination in sort of the, the toughness and commitment and clarity of the vision. Uh, I think the United States and China are both lucky that he was in charge. Maybe just let me follow up. You, you said toughness. And uh, of course, uh, on many dimensions, that's obvious enough. But I was uh, just reading through materials from that period and was struck by accounts of the meeting with Frank Press in uh, mid-1978, where it was decided to bring in essentially exchange of students even before normalization. And then he met with Robert McNamara, I believe, in 1980 to right. talk about the World Bank coming back to China. Uh, and what struck me is this tough, nationalistic, proud Chinese actually minced no words on how badly China needed assistance, whether it was intellectual. And I've just always been interested how you interpret that, that kind of personality and what it took to ask for that kind of fundamental help? Well, I have two main interpretations how he got that pragmatic. Uh, one is that when he was under Mao, Mao was the big philosopher behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and he was essentially the executive who had to administer things. And in a sense, the buck stopped there. I mean, as, as general secretary of the party, that was what he had to do. Second, you know, he was a wartime military uh, political officer. For 12 years, they were under constant battles. Uh, 
And he didn't have time to go into philosophy and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. He had to get ready for the next battle. Mm -hmm. And after every battle, he would try to regroup the troops and say, and he didn't want to have a single leader because something might happen to the single. You want a team of leaders who could work together. If something happens to one and somebody else is ready to fill in. So I think that pragmatic experience of trying to manage all those battles mm -hmm. and plus uh, the experience as general secretary on the front line whose job it is to make things work just put him in a very different situation than Mao was in. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, I wanted to turn attention to your book but you can steer this uh, in directions you uh, would like. Uh, Fragile Superpower and, and uh, one of the um, chapters and certainly a theme as you say China is strong abroad but fragile at home and I, I have a kind of two part question is what are what do you think are the key domestic weaknesses China has in the current era and how is that shaping its policy uh, and I guess I have a more fundamental question and it, that is if you're weak at home can you in fact be strong abroad for a sustained period, and what are your implications? What are the implications of that domestic weakness, weakness for this um, this uh, sort of uh, uh, juggernaut that some people seem to see on the horizon? Well, I think it's important to see China with clear eyes, and mm -hmm. I think the the reason that China is uh, seen as such a superpower already is because of its dramatic uh, economic growth, which is historically unprecedented to have per capita income growing you know, at over 6% for 30 years. It's never happened before in human history, and um, you know, it has been so rapid. So of course, there is this perception. Most people don't really look inside of China. They just kind of see the image of the um, rapidly growing uh, economy, an economy that recovered first from the global financial crisis when we caused the financial crisis, you might say, um, and are still struggling with it, and the Europeans are too. So I think there's a lot of um, misperceptions out there that China is already uh, such a powerful country. I mean, the story I tell frequently, I'm sure some in the room have already heard it once. I apologize, but when I was writing this book, I uh, wanted to give a heads up to my Chinese friends about the title because I didn't want them to be blindsided by what is a somewhat critical view of China. And uh, I also told my American friends about the title. So when I told my American friends I'm writing a book about Chinese domestic politics and foreign policy called China Fragile Superpower, they were very puzzled and said, well, what do you mean fragile? But when I told my Chinese friends, every single one of them said, what do you mean superpower? And so what I find revealing about that is that they don't see China as all that strong yet, but also no one questioned the internal fragility of China. So why is China fragile and why are its leaders so insecure is because, you know, they're trying to maintain Chinese Communist Party rule over a very vibrant, open, large market economy. It's not the same society or the same economy as Mao's China. And yet the Communist Party is st struggling to stay in power and they feel very vulnerable. They see sort of latent political threats everywhere. So um, I think there are some uh, dangers about that. I mean, on the one hand, the good news is that, as many people said this morning, because China's leaders are focused so much on domestic threats, much more than international threats, they don't want to be in a Cold War, or even worse, a hot war with the United States, for sure, or with their neighbors in other countries, because they don't want to have any international conflicts that could uh, destabilize the situation at home, slow down economic growth, um, and create uh, political problems at home. So I think 
their commitment to rise peacefully is very credible to me. I think they really want to do that. But on the other hand, there are risks when you have this kind of insecure leadership. Not so much of creating international crises in a wag-the-dog sort of way to distract people, but the risks that domestic nationalist public opinion, as articulated on the internet, say, could kind of pressure the policymakers to make threats that they then feel they can't back down from without jeopardizing their standing at home. Or increasingly, I also see that the, uh, with this weak collective leadership that the foreign policy process is quite poorly coordinated uh, and you've got these parochial interest groups that often drive the policy and go off on their own. And they might really get China in trouble um, by overreaching, even though it's not necessarily what the standing committee, if they actually sat down and thought about it, would want to do. So, um, uh, you know, I think that that internal fragility in does represent some serious international risks to us. Well, thank you. Uh, Ken, I'm not going to stay in 1976, although this uh, Alyssa starts from that period, but it's really a current issue. In that 1976 meeting that I was reading about, Wang Hai Rung, I thought it was very interesting, evinced a high degree of strategic mistrust mm -hmm. uh, and said the polar bear, meaning the USSR, is out to fix you. It's going to bite you. But this doesn't exclude the possibility of the, and she meant the United States directing it, meaning the USSR, against us, meaning China. Fast forwarding to today, like many others, I think you believe that uh, mutual strategic mistrust, and we heard that uh, formulation several times this morning, is a key problem in our bilateral relationship. Why do you think this strategic mistrust is so uh, enduring, such a persistent part of this, even though China's radically changed, our, our relationship has radically changed, and yet uh, in very different political times and global situation, we have this uh, strategic mistrust. Uh, I, let me say for three reasons, I'm a little worried I'm going to be like, like uh, Governor Perry and forget the third one. The third <laughs> uh, but, uh, this is in part structural in the international system. It's in part a matter of uh, very different political systems ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in part a matter of a kind of uh, uh, just uh, uncertainty about how the other one is thinking. And those three are related. Uh, structural in the international system, clearly China now uh, has become the second most significant player in the international system. Uh, and I think the narrative in China very much, at a popular level at least, is we're number two, but we're headed for number one. The question is when we get there. Right? Uh, the uh, the uh, companion part of that narrative is, and of course the U.S. as number one doesn't want us to get there, and therefore will do everything it can to either slow or disrupt our ongoing rise. Uh, the U.S. is powerful enough that we can make a lot happen in the world, even though we are tipping into somewhere between the peak of our power and actual decline. But the feature is that we will, we will be tailing off as China rises, right? Uh, so we're powerful enough to make things happen everywhere. And we are strongly incentivized to make sure that China's rise becomes more complicated, not less, right? And there's this kind of con notion of a U.S. that is uh, strategic, disciplined, uh, uh, well-coordinated internally, uh, and determined to disrupt China's rise. Uh, I would argue that every single one of those points is dead wrong, right? But uh, one thing you cannot do very easily is to disprove a conspiracy theory. Because even when you point out to people that uh, you know, we've done this, that, and the other thing that have all, it's hard to imagine we would have done that uh, if we were trying to slow down China's rise. The answer is basically, aren't you clever in how you conceal 
the fact that you're trying to disrupt China's rise. I mean, so it's all, you know, this kind of narrative. Uh, so I think the structural change in the balance of power in, in the global system has helped to foster a narrative that I think draws off of a lot of modern Chinese history, mm -hmm. uh, where they had good reason to distrust the motives of especially Western countries out there, but also Japan, obviously, uh, to have a very tough view of the international system. And now, given the way things are, we're the guys that must be after them. Right? Mm -hmm. On our side, that also feeds in in a fashion, uh, because when we see China, and frankly, especially when you, know, you look at what China says publicly, then you also have access to some other discourse in China, especially when that non-public discourse comes across in more zero-sum terms than the, than the public discourse does, and you have to sit there and think to yourself, well, if they're thinking in terms that their advance has to come at direct cost to us, maybe we ought to be a little right. tougher about that, <laughs> right? And so you get this kind of back and forth. So mm -hmm. I think the structural change in the balance of power is a real problem. Second mm -hmm. problem is different political systems. Uh, I think it is simply a reality that Americans feel, for analytical as well as emotional reasons, uh, that uh, authoritarian political systems are not as trustworthy uh, as our democratic political systems. Uh, they are not as transparent. Uh, they are subject potentially to stronger uh, initiatives in the international arena as well as domestically because there aren't the checks and balances that you associate with more uh, democratic systems. Uh, and there is an emotional component to that, too. Uh, we have, as a country, as Henry Kissinger has written so eloquently about, uh, we've always had this kind of uh, uh, uneasy balance in our foreign policy between America as the proselytizer, you know, our role in the world is to spread democracy versus America acting as in terms of realpolitik. Right? During the Cold War, policy toward the Soviet Union, the two of those lined up completely. You could do anything on the values end because the need to overcome the evil empire was so morally correct that realpolitik and values lined up. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of that disappeared, and not surprisingly, very quickly, all of this reemerged. And China, whatever else it is, is not a democratic, liberal democratic system. Uh, so I think that that's a problem, and it contributes uh, to our uh, distrust. And now I'm going to have a Rick Perry moment. Uh, the third thing How was, people are thinking was your third. Uh, or, yeah, that was your code word. For well, the well, uh, well, I think the underlying reality is that on both sides, we, uh, we have not been able to get to the point where we have uh, deep, uh, very forward-looking uh, discussions about the future. Uh, we have more than 60 formal government-to-government -government dialogues annually. Uh, we have frequent contacts between our highest levels on both sides. Uh, but those discussions are, are about the near term, some long-term aspirations, constructive strategic partnership, this kind of verbiage, right? But the substance is about the near term. Uh, and so we have never had, to my knowledge, for example, Susan, you're deeply involved in issues with North Korea. Uh, I don't think at a government-to-government -government level we've actually sat down and been able to have a serious discussion about different potential contingencies in North Korea how, and how each of us would respond to that, right? right? Uh, we've we, tried. We, yeah, we tried, but we haven't succeeded. We uh, have talked a lot in various kinds of military-to-military -military talks uh, about different aspects of our military relationship. We cannot, to this point, sit down and talk about our overall military postures in Asia our respective military postures. Uh, and the state really pointed out this morning, it is simply uh, not the case that the U.S. military in the Western Pacific is going to have the degrees of freedom that we have enjoyed for many decades now. Right? It's just not the case. It is also not the case, by the way, that the Chinese PLA Navy is going to have real control over the seas out to the first island chain, because we're too strong to let them do that. Uh, but each of us works on a kind of fiction that we can achieve those incompatible objectives, frankly, unrealizable objectives, if we only invest properly and you know, play it smart. Uh, 
we need to have a discussion as to how China can protect its vital interests, which it is rightly absolutely determined to do, and how we at the same time can have a level of capability in the Western Pacific that meets our obligations to friends and allies and serves our own major nation, national interests. We aren't able to have that conversation with China. Right? You can go on to a number of other issues in cybersecurity and space and elsewhere where the same thing is the case. And so we need to get to a point where we can have the kinds of deep, prolonged discussions about the real topics that will shape the future uh, if we're going to overcome mutual strategic distrust. Let me say, by the way, I, I interpret the term strategic distrust not as strictly military strategic, right. but rather as distrust about each other's long-term intentions toward the other. Right? And despite our mature, candid, very pragmatic relationship where we really do know how to manage uh, issues day to day very effectively on both sides. Uh, I would argue that strategic distrust is growing. Uh, and that is sufficiently corrosive that it has to make you, uh, at best, very cautiously optimistic about the future. Thank you. Uh, Ezra. Oh, can, can I just add one word to that, which is uh, there is a Chinese scholar who I know many of you know, Wang Ji Si, uh, who is arguably China's top America specialist. Uh, he and I will have a, uh, a monograph coming out in about two weeks that is on strategic distrust uh, between the U.S. and China, and it's coming out simultaneously in English and Chinese, uh, and it is to articulate him for the Chinese side, me for the U.S. side, what is the narrative our own leaders have constructed that, ex that, that makes them doubt the long-term intentions of the other side? Right? And what are the actions that feed that narrative? And then there are some recommendations as to kinds of things that might chip away at that narrative. Um, Ezra, when you were doing your book, you did spend some time with President Carter and at the Carter Library. Yes. And in his uh, memoirs, the first set that, that came out, he talked a little about having been in the Navy and having gone to Shandong, Qingdao, as I recall, and been impressed how... But I guess, can you give us some insight into President Carter's uh, thinking, the motivations? He came in, wanted to do what became Camp David, and, and then Panama Canal, and then ultimately normalization with China. How did he think about prioritizing those issues? Why did he think that way? I, I remember being at Taiwan in Taiwan at that time, and just before I was leaving Taiwan, got called in and said, will President Carter normalize relations with China? And I said, no, he won't do it until his second term. That was the common wisdom there, uh, proved in error. So what was President Carter's thinking and calculus? He seemed to have a moral objective, uh, and he seemed to have a real politique objective. I guess I would go back to his Sunday school teaching, mm -hmm. uh, because you know he was a Sunday school teacher. And he said as a child, he put a nickel each week in a box that was to help the missionaries in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the conversations he had with Deng at, at the White House uh, in 79 uh, when he visited was, uh, uh, I think you should have uh, allow freedom of religion in China. And mm -hmm. Deng uh, said, we don't need your missionaries, uh, but uh, we, we will open up you know, and, and encourage, and we will allow the Bible to be translated. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think Carter from way back had a deep desire that this is the other side of the world. We ought to be working with these people. Mm -hmm. And I think that he relished the thought that he could play a major role in completing that. Mm -hmm. And um, however, uh, uh, because of this Panama Canal and Congress, uh, he was really worried they couldn't get congressional support mm -hmm. uh, for normalization. And uh, I think there's no question that his appointment of Woodcock in the first place, uh, some that Ken knows well, uh, that uh, Woodcock was a negotiator and was a tough negotiator, but a respected one, one who was respected by all sides and could be counted on. And I think he put him in charge of the liaison office in Beijing with the notion they would go ahead, and this is the guy who will ne uh, in, uh, negotiate relations with China. In terms of uh, Carter's global strategy, uh, I think he had a lot to learn when he became president. 
Um, you know, remember in the Korean Peninsula, he was going to pull out all our troops uh, mm -hmm. from Korea too quickly. Uh, and uh, he didn't have a very clear negotiation. Uh, I think our academic colleague, whom all of us know well, Mike Oxenberg, mm -hmm. really played a very critical role in going back and reading through those notes and the notes of th that he and Woodcock uh, uh, made as part of the recording after the events to, to try to get set down the history. Uh, it's uh, quite clear uh, that Mike Oxenberg had a vision of how to get it through politically, too. I mean, mm -hmm. you send uh, Senator Kennedy to Beijing because he'll come back and report you know, some things and help get the issue and how to manage it politically mm -hmm. as well as how to, uh, he was constantly on the lookout. Uh, of course, there were you know, human rivalries between some people in the State Department. Uh, and I think that, um, Carter, in a way, was above those detailed considerations of strategy and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think he really wanted to improve relations with China because it was good, it was the right thing to do, the world needed it. And I think that Carter we see after the presidency that's so concerned, in a way, with social service around the world, you mm -hmm. know, represents that kind of deeper idealism that underlay what he was doing during his term as president. Mm -hmm. Let me just end before throwing it open. You you talked just in passing about Deng and Tiananmen, and, and uh, we've identified the enormous positive consequences for the Chinese people of reform and for the rest of the world, uh, and uh, certainly the normalization with the U.S. and so forth. I guess I'd just be interested in your wisdom about how large should Tiananmen loom in the assessment of Deng? Is that an unfortunate uh, bump <clears throat> along the road, or what? Um, Steve Roy, you know, when I was talking to him about this, uh, reminded me that uh, Jefferson and uh, George Washington were holders of slaves. Mm -hmm. And that's a horrible, inhumane thing to do. And one does not excuse that, and one acknowledges that. But if you're writing the history of the era, uh, does that become the real central issue that describes Deng's role in history? Um, I was one of you know, the many who watched uh, Tiananmen, uh, things that happened and feeling how horrible it was and what an awful uh, slaughter of people, innocent people in the streets. Uh, so I think it was a horrible thing. Um, I felt as, as biographer my role is to try to put all this in historical perspective and say what is the, the significance of that, what, what, what were the origins, uh, what was his thinking and putting it down. One of the things that <coughs> uh, I really believe, and I wish I could get uh, the smoking gun on this, I, I really believe he probably could have cleared the square without the big crackdown. But I, I, I think because there were times when the, the numbers got pretty low, and, he, and you know they, they did in uh, 1986, uh, April 5th, uh, uh, they cleared the, the square under comparable circumstances. 76? 76. 76, yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, 76. Um, it, they, they, they might have cleared at that time, but I think he felt that the discipline throughout society was getting too loose, and you needed a tighter discipline, and you needed that kind of some strong effort of the government crackdown to provide the kind of glue. From his point of view, um, if giving freedom is good if the if political situation can stand it, but sometimes political freedom can be s seen as softness and laxity and a lot of people take advantage of it, and things get worse. Mm -hmm. And um, he was old. He was not as in touch with public opinion as when he was young. He may have made errors in judgment. I think it's hard to second guess and know. Uh, but I think the historical role is that he played the critical role in opening China. Mm -hmm. Ken, you said you'd like to say something. Well, yeah, yeah, Susan may well too. Yeah, um, I, I actually have a harsher judgment of Deng than um, 
And let me say, I, my overall sense of Dung, and what I've always said about him, and I mean very much, is he was a great man because he could manage to uh, move China in a very significantly different direction and manage the politics of doing yes, so, exactly. so that it didn't just you know, fly apart uh, in some catastrophic fashion. And I think that was a mark of genius of him. Uh, but I don't think that that uh, means that he handled every major development in a reasonable way. I thought Tiananmen was, a, was in part a result of his own disastrous misjudgments. Uh, the, uh, I was there, let me say, for the two weeks. I was there the first two weeks of May, left for a week, and then came back, and then left on June 5th. I was on Tiananmen Square when that occurred, and it was catastrophic. Uh, and it was needlessly catastrophic because he could have cleared the square before then. Uh, what was happening in the several weeks leading up to June 4th was the government was taking back control of uh, place after place in Beijing. Uh, most of the people on the square were no longer Beijingers. Uh, they had mostly given up and gone home. Uh, they were demoralized. Uh, the government was winning, uh, and he sent in the troops. And uh, the uh, and I think to this day that the main reason he did that had nothing to do with Beijing. It had everything to do with the uh, enormous array of Chinese cities, more than 80, that were having comparable demonstrations. And he felt that to regain control in the country as a whole, he had to act absolutely decisively in Beijing, and that would alleviate him of the need to take back the country city by city, if you will. You know? And so I think that's why he did it. Um, you have to ask yourself, and, and by the way, it was you know, after all, it was his reaction to the initial demonstrations that hardened the, the, the views of the demonstrators. So I think he escalated this in a way that reflected his being somewhat out of touch with what was really uh, going on. Uh, the question I've asked myself, and as all historical counterfactuals, there is no answer, right? But there were reform currents in uh, China in the late 70s uh, that would have produced a very different trajectory from what we actually saw. Uh, and those currents had just under half the members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo on board. One swing vote uh, would have changed, potentially changed history if Dung, if Dung allowed that to occur. So this is not radical leftism or radical conservatism or something like that. This was people at the top of the system who wanted to respond differently and in that response moved the system forward and Dung set it back dramatically. Uh, given that he had made that fundamental choice, then how he played it out, especially you know, waiting for a few years and then in 92 coming back and moving things forward again, is all very good. But you know, that's recovering from what, to my mind, was a catastrophic set of decisions that he made at the time that cost a lot of lives and I think potentially cost China its ability to make the changes that it may now in the coming decade regret that it didn't make much earlier. I think we agree more than than you imply. Oh. Uh, I, I, what I meant was uh, by saying that uh, he was concerned about the broader aspects of discipline, not just clearing the square. That's what I had in mind, was precisely the other cities. And I think there is a good question, is if the reforms had gone further, I mean, there are several key points where one might have, uh, made differences. At the time, democracy walled in December 78. Deng initially supported those, but then before long he decided to close down. Hu Yaobang, we now know, wanted to keep them open. Mm -hmm. Had he followed that at that time, things might have been different. I think it's also clear that Deng was not entirely opposed to these reforms. That in 1986, he gave Zhao Ziyang the freedom to have a very major discussion mm -hmm. about political reform. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he was not as completely against all kinds of reforms as some people have said. He was willing to consider that. I think, uh, I agree that he made some strategic errors. I think in 1988 he made a very strategic error about uh, prices and decontrolling prices at a time that shouldn't have been. I think that editorial uh, yeah. in the April, came out in April 26 that uh, used the term uh, Dunguan, turmoil, yeah. uh, scared the students and made the situation worse. I think those were bad errors of judgment. Uh, 
that are not unrelated to the fact that uh, he was isolated uh, as a very older person uh, from those uh, situations. I, th I think he felt that, you know, Hui Bang, as General Secretary of the Youth League, tried to encourage people and, and uh, give them optimism and hope and support. Uh, Deng, as General Secretary of the Party, uh, at the same time, the Obama was its secretary of the Youth League, felt the buck stopped there, and that he was operating in a very tense situation, and he felt that he had to clamp down, and that could have been an error in judgment. Now it's time for you to be able to ask your questions. I'll try to move my selections around the room as I see hands. Yes. Yes. Can you speak up a little? Yes. Um, I'm very interested. I just spent some time there, and the name of this panel was Domestic Evolution from Mount Dove, the 21st Century. Uh, would you mind There's a narrow topic for you. <laughs> Susan, you want to take a stab and then everybody else? Well, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao came into office um, with the idea of doing what I think of as a kind of populist adjustment to the reform policies. Um, because marketization and opening had led to a tremendous spurt of economic dynamism and growth. And um, uh, in the initial period, everyone had done better, um, including the people in the countryside. But um, uh, income gaps had widened. Uh, the social welfare net had been destroyed by decollectivization and moving away from um, the Maoist system, so health and education, all these social goods, pensions needed to be fixed. So the platform, the agenda at the start of the Hu Wen administration, I think, made a lot of sense because it was not anti-market. It was just to make these adjustments at the margin to make uh, market reform kind of more sustainable and more equitable. But in the process, those things didn't happen. And instead, uh, the elite just got a larger and larger share of the benefits of policy. And, you know, um, both of those two leaders uh, appear to have been um, reluctant to exert much personal authority. They admittedly are in a system that discourages that. It's, you know, collective rule. They're uh, who is just first among equals. But, uh, you know, so I don't think history will judge him too positively in terms of the actual accomplishments, although the intentions might have been good. Um, one thing that he has tried to make a legacy about is Taiwan. And he really um, tried to reach out and take a different approach to Taiwan, especially after Mind Joe's election, to win hearts and minds of the people of Taiwan, to peacefully um, integrate Taiwan into uh, the Chinese economy and um, to prevent uh, independence in that way and to aim at eventual something you could call reunification. So I think his legacy there has been very positive. It's very interesting that he's protected Taiwan policy from the trends toward a kind of more provocative Chinese foreign policy 
in other areas, but Taiwan policy has been protected by who? Um, and you know that's been quite a good thing, and I think a substantial amount has been achieved in cross-strait relations. So I'd say maybe that's his most positive legacy. I think uh, many people in China, many people outside of China, had some hopes to see some gradual introduction of political reform, none of which has really happened. I mean, there are talk about governance, uh, normatively, they've embraced rule of law, transparency, a lot of ideas that have been accepted normatively and yet, again, have not really been realized on the ground. Um, before going to the lady in the rear, I just I thought maybe I'd add to that. I'd put it in a little more system-wide view. It seems to me that the Chinese system's selecting for what you might call transactional kind of leaders, system maintenance, more and less not radical transformation because China's becoming a more complicated society and more differentiated and even who is the leader becomes a bargain among many competing right. groups. Uh, and the real question for the future is whether the big changes, and I think China does require some big changes, are they selecting for the kind of leaders that can in fact produce big change? And in that sense, I see what's going on as a, and it's perfectly understandable, perfectly predictable. I would agree the Taiwan uh, area has been a bright spot. Uh, but more fundamentally, is China going to be producing the big think people uh, at the top of that system? And I think China can't defer a lot of its big political changes indefinitely. But it, it this may be in the spirit of everything that's important to say has been said, but not everyone has said it. And so <laughs> let me uh, add a gloss if I could. First of all, in Taiwan, I would give Hu even more credit than Susan has, because in 2005, he really pushed change, a fundamental change in policy toward Taiwan that then laid the groundwork, arguably enhanced the prospects for Ma ying to be elected in 2008, and certainly has been quite successful. Secondly, uh, there is this kind of uh, dichotomy, if you will, or contradiction. China has enjoyed unbelievably rapid economic growth during the entire Hu Won period, including through the uh, financial crisis. Uh, and yet they have not made necessary reforms in the system. I would argue the growth over the last decade has been primarily the results of the reforms of their predecessors that were pushed through in the late 90s and 2001, 2002. And then they've enjoyed the benefits of those, but have not kept reform going. Uh, so thirdly, as people look back historically, the question was how will historians view him? I think they will see this now as a critical change having occurred in China on the watch of the current administration in China. And that is the change from always asking what are the major uh, uh, constraints on China's development that this leadership has overcome to where there are such enormously powerful and well-financed vested interests in China. Some are geographical, some are in the private sector, some are in the public, you know, major SOEs. I mean, there are a variety of them. But they are so powerful now that the system is experiencing relative stasis. And uh, my guess is that we're only going to see China again engage in substantial reform if a crisis drives that reform, because otherwise it's hard to see how you pull together enough authority uh, to overcome these vested interests. So there's really a major change in the balance, if you will, within the system in the last decade that, that should be worrisome on the Chinese side, and certainly as I look at China, is worrisome to me. Ezra, just briefly, <coughs> and then we'll uh, get yeah. questions. <laughs> It'd be briefly. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the way I would put it, and basically consensus with my colleagues, is that he's, his policies toward uh, the new balance between the coast and the inner China has been well received and is appropriate. Mm -hmm. In the early days of reform, everybody pushed coastal development, and now the effort to build infrastructure roads uh, so, uh, and, and uh, railways to the inner, and to channel more resources to the village for uh, welfare and uh, reduce taxes, I think that has been well received as good policy. I think where he has been weak is in uh, two things. One is the corruption issue. Uh, 
And I think that is one thing that needs a much stronger, firmer hand. Mm -hmm. I think it's conceivable that they could do that by consensus even without a very powerful leader. I, I think my understanding is that the, the uh, Politburo Standing Committee are still quite strong. And if you get a strong consensus among that group mm -hmm. about really doing something about corruption, I think it's conceivable that they could really do something in the next group. Um, the other thing is I think in foreign relations, is his direction was good, but he was weak. And instead of keeping down the military and others uh, when they seem to antagonize some of the countries around them, that he waited till his visit to the United States and then got that under control. Mm -hmm. it, it, but it took it, it more time and more effort to get it under control, and a strong leader might have been able to stop it sooner. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, lady in the rear there. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you speak up? Can I make a quick sure. response to that? The Arab Spring uh, jolted China, jolted the leaders of China, I think, uh, most fundamentally because it highlighted to them uh, the uh, unpredictable power of uh, social media, of uh, the capacity to communicate digitally and how that can uh, weaken an authoritarian leadership, even one that thinks it is well ensconced and in solid control. Um, and uh, I think there's a second aspect of this that, that is notable, especially given uh, Ezra's extensive comments about how close Deng Xiaoping was to George H.W. Bush. Uh, keep in mind it took George H.W. Bush about three weeks to s decide with the demonstrators in Tiananmen Square. I think Deng never forgot that. You would know better than I, but I suspect he never forgot it and saw it as a huge betrayal. And it took um, Barack Obama only two weeks to tell our 30-year ally Hosni Mubarak that he must go. Uh, so I think this feeds a kind of narrative in China that the U.S. is uh, perfectly prepared on short notice to side with uh, disruptive uh, folks in society want to overthrow the system and to use social media as we did in, in parts at least of our engagement with the Arab Spring uh, to further that disruption and further that instability. Um, I agree with all that but just one other point which is uh, when we talk about the strong vested interests there are also strong vested interests in the security forces and in the propaganda agencies who uh, benefit from hyping the threat. They get more money, they get more power, you know, they're more important in the system. And it doesn't take much to, f to reinforce the paranoia of an authoritarian leader, which, I mean, a lot of this is structural. It's not about personality. This is just, you know, the nature of being leader in a system where you don't have very good information about what people actually think about you, how strong the support is, and, you know, it's never happened that you had a communist rule in this type of society. That, you know, and especially since 89, Tiananmen, the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, I'm not at all surprised that they feel extremely well, nervous and insecure. I think what I'm going to have to do out of consideration of time is ask the three hands I see uh, just to state your questions, and then we'll go down from Ezra and let people pick and choose among what they feel most comfortable addressing. Yes, sir. Uh, 
question. Yes, sir, and then I'll wind up with Beverly, and we'll then move down from Ezra. Well, my question is very different, so I hope you remember Jerry's que uh -huh. question. Um, I teach foreign policy at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky, and this has been a long-time intellectual interest of mine. Um, I think show and lie was one of the unsung heroes of this whole process. You know, we always look at everything from our viewpoint, rightfully so, uh, and I, I don't think there's I think there's an unlimited amount of credit that President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger and uh, our side deserve. But I'm really fascinated, and uh, Dr. Shirk, you hit on this. Um, you know, Joe and Lai was in that room when you were visiting with, with that group. And how did he get, and I've read a lot about Joe and Lai, but how did he get to that position considering Mao's cult of personality, considering Mao's wife, clearly hated him, considering the gang of four. And my other simple question, I always pose when I teach about China to, to my graduate students, um, that it is there is such a thing as being a good person in a bad system. I'm a moderate, so I am certainly not a fan of communism or making apologies for communism, and I think Mao is one of the worst people to ever live. But I submit to my students at the end of classes, that I think Joe and Lai was a decent and honorable man who did the best he could given the hands he was dealt in a horrific system. Is that correct? <laughs> Good question. Uh, yes, Beverly. <laughs> There's an easy question. Ezra? I'll try to be brief. <clears throat> uh, the Chinese buy our bonds uh, because they earn a lot of income uh, from the sales and the trade imbalances. But, uh, and they've learned that <clears throat> to try to dump them quickly would be costly to them because it would devalue all the things well. But I think in the future you're going to find that they're going to increasingly uh, by uh, uh, energy sources and invest in the round of the world and in a much broader range of things uh, and probably be less new investment in bonds. On Zhou Enlai, uh, he was uh, a force even before Mao. Uh, he was a leader in France of the, of the Chinese students there that included uh, Deng Xiaoping and, and uh, Li Fuchun and Ye Rongzhen and some other very, uh, Chen Yi and some very important other leaders. And so he was there before Mao. Uh, he was criticized in the Yan'an period, and he realized that his future depended on being 150% behind everything that Mao wanted, and he was therefore a very weak person. And a lot of the critics of him feel that uh, he didn't do enough during the Cultural Revolution, that he, by joining with Mao, uh, he made it possible for the regime to survive. He handled the details. So 
the view among intellectuals is somewhat mixed about his ultimate uh, role. Um, finally, uh, on the, the third point, it, it was... Um, you don't have to answer all. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, the, 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 the Yugong, uh, moving the mountains. Um, you know, there, there's no easy answer, of course. But I think, at the very least, this new uh, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping and the poll, you're going to have to take a much tougher stand on corruption. I think you're going to have to get a different system for financing the countryside that provides some taxation so that the local people don't go only to selling real estate to make money for the countryside, which fuels a lot of the corruption. I think some new structural uh, way of financing local uh, independent governments is going to be needed. So I think those are two very important basic issues that have to be confronted. I'll just be very brief. I really don't have uh, too much to add. Uh, Joe and Lai, actually there's criticism of him even during the Great Leap Forward, and uh, there are moments in which if he had, uh, there was uh, one meeting at which uh, people were starting to say, well, we should all take the blame for the problems, which would have been a way of getting Mao into that. And then he stood up and defended Mao. So I think, um, you know, there are a lot of good people in China at the elite level, not just Zhou Enlai. And um, I, I, the historical judgment on him, I think, will be very mixed. Um, on how to move forward in solving problems. I just want to note that it's really pretty amazing that the State Council, China's cabinet, the Development Research Center, joined with the World Bank to publicly, uh, I mean, to do a report on what needs to be done to revive uh, the re momentum of economic reform for the new administration that's going to be coming in in China. Mm -hmm. Unlike in the past where people in think tanks would do this quietly, they put them on the shelf, then the leaders could take them or leave them. Now it's out there for everybody to see what's been proposed. So it's a very new way of doing things and, you know, it's kind of hopeful. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Ken? Uh, I raised two issues. One, this kind of a rural poverty and urban wealth issue. Uh, the way I think about it is uh, China is uh, a place that you should think of as a series of islands with a total population of about 450 million people uh, who have a, by global standards, a nearly middle class standard of living. Uh, surrounded by a sea of a, close to 900 million people who live in the third world. Uh, and the islands and that sea interact in every way all the time. Can't think of one without the other. Uh, no Chinese leader thinks of one without the other. That interaction shapes China. Uh, very few foreigners think of the sea. Foreigners tend to come to China and see the islands and think they've seen China. And until we appreciate that you have both of those dimensions and they interact systematically always, uh, you, you can't do a very good job of understanding either the way Chinese leaders think or where China is headed. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, China's development model that has produced the results that we all are aware of is exhausted. China realizes it's exhausted. The 12 five-year plan lays out systematically a new development model. Uh, that new development model uh, is very much in America's interest for China to effectively implement. The U.S. model to date is now in deep trouble. Uh, we, like the Chinese, need to rebalance our economy. Our major issue, obviously, is fiscal and is manageable now, but 10 years from now isn't unless we rewrite to some extent our social contract and get our political act together. So both sides are now facing enormous challenges in getting the political wherewithal to do what each of us knows we have to do ourselves. 
I'll leave it to you to judge whether they're going to get there or not. I am not wildly optimistic on either side, frankly. Uh, but I would argue that to the extent that each of us does succeed, not only will our own country be better off, but U.S.-China relations will be much smoother. Because what each of us needs to do is now profoundly in the economic interests of the other country, too. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I um, thought I'd just um, underscore something uh, Dr. Kissinger said at lunch, which I think is a good segue off stage with respect to this connection between domestic politics and the U.S.-China relation. And that really is, he enjoined us to say, you know, leadership is about managing your domestic politics so you can conduct a sensible power with the strategically most important country in the world to you. And you can, even, you can either let that domestic politics drive you in a direction that's going to be very unproductive or you can manage and take leadership of this relationship and push it in at least marginally better directions. I think that's a good way to sort of sum up what our obligation is with respect to domestic politics and U.S.-China relations. Thank all of you for coming. Thank my colleagues of long standing. And